In this video, you will understand why Kubernetes dominated the cloud and how it quickly became the de facto standard tool for managing cloud native applications. In 2015, the term cloud native started getting really popular because it emphasizes applications designed specifically for cloud environments. A cloud native app is one that's distributed into mini applications called microservices. You don't want your app to be this one big chunky and clunky hard to update monolith. Instead, you wanna split it into many microservices where each one performs a specific task and runs inside of a container, ideally. A container is a lightweight environment that isolates your application by ensuring that it only runs with the resources and dependencies that it needs. This containerization allows your app to run reliably anywhere, whether that's your laptop or some cloud provider, which is what makes containerized microservices truly cloud native, their ability to run reliably anywhere across different environments, on top of the fact that they're ideal for the cloud's need to scale very quickly and deploy very fast. Now, the microservice architecture isn't perfect. Every benefit comes with a drawback in the sense that the more microservices you have, they become harder to manage. Think about things like resource allocation. How do you efficiently distribute memory and CPU across numerous microservices? That requires a lot of manual orchestration. Think about resiliency. When a service becomes unresponsive for whatever reason, what mechanisms can we employ to ensure that the container is automatically resurrected and restarted back to a healthy state? Think about things like load balancing. If an app is getting lots of traffic, it can eventually run out of memory or CPU. How do you dynamically scale up instances of that microservice and balance the load to ensure that traffic is distributed equally among all your application instances. These are just a few of the many considerations that you need to be mindful of when managing containers because deploying containers is just the beginning. Anybody can do that, that's the easy part. The real challenge and expertise lies in efficiently managing and orchestrating your containers at scale. Well, let's go back to 2014 when an engineer from Google revealed that they were releasing two billion containers a year. They had their own in-house container orchestration tool called Borg that dealt with all of these problems and automated things like scaling, resiliency, resource orchestration, load balancing, among many other features. And based on their success with Borg, Google open sourced the container orchestration platform Kubernetes that same year. And because of Google's credibility, um, Kubernetes is now the de facto standard tool for container orchestration. So let's assume you have Kubernetes hosted on AWS, Azure, or Google Cloud, then Kubernetes can be described as a software that runs across many virtual machines. If you have Kubernetes hosted on your own servers on-premise, which is typical to government agencies that require more security, then Kubernetes can be described as a software that runs across many physical servers. Now, regardless, these machines in the world of Kubernetes, we refer to as nodes. And these nodes, these machines, they collaborate. They work together under the supervision of Kubernetes to manage your container workloads. They come together to form a unified Kubernetes cluster that can orchestrate your containers at scale. So in a Kubernetes cluster, some machines are designated as master nodes, forming the brains of the operation, while the other machines, the other nodes, are worker nodes. The master nodes, they make decisions about when and where your container workloads will run, while the worker nodes, they have the infrastructure to actually run your container workloads. Let me dive a bit deeper. So the pod in Kubernetes is the smallest deployable unit, meaning you can't deploy containers directly. They must be wrapped in a pod. Now to deploy an application, I can simply specify a configuration that declares what my container will be called and the image a pre-built package of my application source code and dependencies from which the container will be created. And the resources that the application needs in order to run, like the CPU and memory, I simply have to declare this configuration and upon submitting it to the cluster, the Kubernetes control plane just springs into action.
But ultimately, what I wanted to convey is not necessarily what's going on behind the scenes, but show you that this process really illustrates Kubernetes' declarative nature. We simply declare, we simply state what we want. And behind the scenes, there are so many moving parts where Kubernetes manages the complex details of deployment, resource allocation, and maintenance. It also goes further in orchestrating the discovery of these services. Every pod has a virtual IP address by which it can be accessed, by which it can be connected to. But pods in Kubernetes are ephemeral, which means they, um, they get destroyed or recreated very often. That's why Kubernetes offers a primitive called a service that specifically binds to pods with a certain label, like great submission. And regardless of their individual IP address, all great submission pods, they share this label, which effectively allows the service to consistently route traffic to them. And not only do services in Kubernetes make it really easy to connect to our applications, they also act as natural load balancers. If multiple instances of the great submission app are running simultaneously, the service will evenly distribute incoming traffic among them. And this ensures that the load is balanced across all available pods. Okay. And now one of the most powerful features that Kubernetes provides is storage orchestration. Manually provisioning storage for your databases is really, really hard work. Kubernetes automates that for you. For each database instance, Kubernetes allows you to define your storage requirements in a persistent volume claim. When the Kubernetes control plane behind the scenes sees your persistent volume claim, your PVC, it takes on the burden of looking through all of the nodes in your cluster, every machine in your cluster, and within one of them, Kubernetes will try to find a physical piece of storage and create a persistent volume linked to your claim. This allows any data that gets saved to your MongoDB database to be redirected to a persistent volume to a durable piece of storage that lives inside of some node. And what's really powerful here is that it doesn't matter where your Kubernetes cluster is deployed, be it AWS, Azure, or Google Cloud, Kubernetes abstracts away the underlying infrastructure. It itself is going to take on the burden of scanning every node for that piece of storage and provision it for the container that needs it. Now, speaking of platforms, one of Kubernetes' biggest selling points is the fact that it's vendor neutral. And it works the same way regardless of whether your cluster is deployed on AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, or on-premises. Kubernetes abstracts away the underlying infrastructure, which means you can define your applications as configuration once and deploy them anywhere Kubernetes runs. In other words, no more vendor lock-in. I want to finalize this video by emphasizing that deploying your application on a Kubernetes cluster, it automates very powerful mechanisms that are needed to manage and orchestrate the life cycle of your containers at scale. Kubernetes handles things like service discovery, load balancing, resource management, storage orchestration, as you just saw, and many, many other complex tasks that are challenging to implement on your own. So by abstracting away all of these intricacies, Kubernetes, Kubernetes lets you focus on just developing your cloud native app while it takes on the burden, while it takes care of the operational heavy lifting. That is why Kubernetes dominated the cloud and became the de facto standard for managing cloud native applications across virtually every major platform. If you enjoyed this video and want to learn how to develop and deploy cloud native apps on Kubernetes, click on the link below to access the Kubernetes bootcamp at a discounted price, and I will see you inside.